on this episode of Rebel Spirit Radio. I discovered that my pure essence was, first of all, indefatigable, Mm. was completely delightfully persistent, was extraordinarily brilliant in ways that I didn't even know existed uh, and that I'm not sure I can define. Hmm. But I lean into that unusual nature of who I am, the spirit in me, that here it is, that believes in humanity. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, author Stephanie Mines joins me to discuss her book, The Secret of Resilience, Healing Personal and Planetary Trauma Through Morphogenesis. Stephanie explains how we have been encouraged to forget and the importance of remembering our wisdom. She discusses the original brilliance of our primordial fire and the pure potentiality we each possess and the importance of making contributions in whatever way our spirit guides us to do so. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Stephanie Mines, PhD, earned her doctorate in neuropsychology at the Union Institute. She is the founder of the Tara Approach, a nonprofit dedicated to providing sustainable health options to individuals and communities, and the founder of Climate Change and Consciousness, a global network to accelerate regenerative responses to the climate crisis. She is the author of five books, including We Are All in Shock, Energy Healing for Traumatic Times. She joins me today to discuss her latest book, The Secret of Resilience, Healing Personal and Planetary Trauma Through Morphogenesis. Stephanie, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. And I thought that one of the places that we could begin is in ter- this idea of resiliency. I may stumble over that word a few times, so bear with me. But you noted in the book that the book models how to remember your wisdom. And this is something that kind of keeps coming up in conversations I'm having with people, this idea that we need to remember. So I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by this about what you mean by remembering our wisdom to live with resiliency? Wonderful. I mean more and more. Mm about that with every passing day. I recently posited that what will save us is what we think we have forgotten. Mm. And what we have forgotten is our connection with each other, our connection with the earth. We have forgotten our kindness we have forgotten that we have the capacity to see that which is unseen. And we have forgotten the wisdom that is innate Mm. to us. And that is largely what I mean, because as an embryologist, I understand that statement of remembering our wisdom as physiology, meaning When all of us, no matter where we are, no matter what our lineage, when we were in utero, we encountered the most fundamental challenges to existence that could possibly exist, each of us in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we surmounted those challenges in a spectrum that is vast to manifest our purpose in life. That's the wisdom we have forgotten. Mm. We did that somatically. We did that by following our senses. We did it innately. And then we were instructed that we couldn't possibly remember that, that that couldn't possibly be available to us 
because we didn't have the kind of brain function that people identify with adults. We had a very conscious brain function, but it was beyond what mm. people are capable of as adults because it was undifferentiated, it was all encompassing, it was absorptive and it was focused. And what we were focused on was manifesting our purpose. Mm. That's what I mean. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. And you know, one of the things I, th there's so many things <laughs> that actually I would like to say in response to all of that, it brings up a lot of things. I think, you know, one, I think about, you know, we've heard that pregnant mothers, you know, talk to the baby, you know, the, the, you know, the unborn baby, it can hear play, you know, classical music for it. And that there is an awareness that is part of this and that we, unfold, you know, along set paths, right? And what you were just saying about sort of the being in touch with this greater consciousness, I know one of the things that's kind of fascinating to me is it has this different vision of consciousness in a way. It's not that it's consciousness produced by the brain. Right. And I was thinking in terms of people, they've done uh, studies with people on like psychedelics and instead of the brain getting more active, the brain actually quiets down to allow that greater consciousness. And so that's how I was thinking in terms of what you were just saying is if the brain isn't fully developed, it can't filter all of that out yet. So it's going to have access to this greater consciousness. Exactly. And, you know, my doctoral research really was in two things that kind of merged the forward-facing theme was traumatic brain injury. Mm. That was what my dissertation was about. And that was where I focused my attention uh, in my doctoral research. But behind that, the understory of that really was neurodevelopment. So it's my understanding of the magnitude of neurodevelopment that takes place, place at very high speed in utero that helps me to see what I call original brilliance. Mm. That is also embryonic intelligence. Those two things are mirrors of one another. Our embryonic intel intelligence, the intelligence of the embryo, which is highly sensory and somatic, has within it the original brilliance that is probably the most important thing we have to remember. And I think the second most important thing we need to remember is that we can express from that original brilliance. Wonderful. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about the original brilliance. So thank you for that. And something that immediately came to my mind and I I've got your book here in front of me, but it was the, excuse me, the afterword was written by the perspective of an indigenous Taoist by Spring Chang. And as you were talking about this original brilliance, what I was thinking was the Taoist concept of poo. It's, they call it the uncarved block. And it's like this pure potential. Is that kind of what you're getting yes. at this original brilliance? Yes. And I love that you have linked that. And nobody else has referred to the afterword. <laughs> so I, I love you for making that connection, Nick, of uh, the afterword was written by my dear friend, Dr. Spring Chung, who is also on the faculty of the Regenerative Health mm. MA PhD program. And I think our bond as women and as healthcare providers and as artists is in that mutual understanding of what original brilliance really is. So the original brilliance is a kind of a pure potential, and that's what we have forgotten. We have forgotten the potential and creativity of what it means to be human. Yes, thank you. That is a beautiful, more concise summary than anything I have proposed. I like it very much. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to make sure I'm on the right track. <laughs> you are on the right track. Yes. So, all right. No, but there's something else that... I think is in connection to this. And you, you mentioned this at the very beginning of the book, and I think it's connected, but 
I want to see how you are connecting it because you wrote that the prenatal being, that there is a prenatal being who is still alive in you. Mm-hmm. And uh, you also refer to it as the genius inside of you. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could actually say a little bit more about this prenatal being, you know, is it that pure potential or, you know, yeah. What can, what else can you tell me about that? It's the recognition that that prenatal embryonic being is still alive in me. Mm. That saves me every day. And I believe has always saved me, but in these challenging times where making it through a day without dissolving into grief is a feat of resilience, I am very conscious that I am saved, not by my adult resources, Mm. but by my embryonic intelligence and that pure essence that I have Finally claimed, Nick, finally claimed. And I say this with utter sincerity and pure transparency, it wasn't easy. Claiming my embryonic intelligence was not easy for me because of the circumstances of my life. But claiming it, which I feel is alive in me all the time, is what allows me to continue and allows me to continue delivering my message Mm. because my message, which thankfully you have heard, but many people don't, Mm. uh, it, it is a stunning message. It is a controversial message. It's a message that arouses people's skepticism and resistance. And When I speak about it, uh, for instance, in the context of being a climate change activist, people don't get it. So how do those things come together? My dear husband, who supports everything that I do and who is an environmental attorney and who believes in me completely, his perennial question to me is, well, where are you going with this, Stephanie? Because he's all about carbon reduction and eliminating fossil fuels, and I am too, but he doesn't see how I'm getting there. I'm getting there through the reclamation of original brilliance, through remembering. Mm. And that's what I have done for myself. And it gives me the vitality that I have at the age of 79. So what does that mean? That was your question. And I feel like (laughs) I actually haven't answered it. I've come from my heart, but let me Mm. also come from a more precise response, I discovered that my pure essence was, first of all, indefatigable, Mm. was completely delightfully persistent, was extraordinarily brilliant in ways that I didn't even know existed uh, and that I'm not sure I can define. But I lean into that unusual nature of who I am, the spirit in me, here it is, that believes in humanity. Hmm. There is no evidence (laughs) for that faith right? because we are committing suicide. Mm -hmm. But I believe in humanity because... I found that original brilliance in me and therefore I believe everyone can find it. And when that happens, we will turn this around Mm. because in living with original brilliance, we cannot betray our mother earth the way we are. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, you know, when you were talking about that, there, you, you, you spoke in the book about, some of the elements, the the four elements. And one of them was the primordial fire. And so when you were just speaking, that's what came to mind because I was connecting it to, you describe it as, you know, everyone's inextinguishable flame of purpose. And I was thinking of it in terms of the spark, you know, that spark that drives us, that spark of creativity. And then the other thing, if I may, this is something that I think connects to this. 
And it could be an answer for your husband. But I was reminded, I, I don't know if you've ever read Aldo Leopold. His famous work is a Sand County Almanac. And there's this brief section in there that's called Thinking Like a Mountain. And in it, he describes being in New Mexico in the 1940s. And he's with a group of other people and they see some wolves. And at the time, the, you know, the idea was that, you know, the only good wolf was a dead wolf. And because, you know, less wolves meant more deer, more deer meant more hunting, right? So they just start shooting indiscriminately at these wolves and they go down to where they were. And he gets there just in time to see like this mama wolf dying. And he says, he describes it as that he saw a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. And it's that fierce green fire that is, I think, that primordial fire that you were talking about, that it's not just in wolves and cats and dogs, but everything alive has that. Yes. I say yes to yeah. everything that you just said. And I appreciate that you've identified that element, the element of primordial fire that I learned from a teacher of mine, probably my most significant teacher now of blessed memory and ancestor, Mary Eno Burmeister, who taught me about the elements. And she actually taught me about five elements because mm. primordial fire is included as mm. an unnamed element. Yeah. And so she taught me of the elements of earth, water, wood, mm. air, fire, and its subset of primordial fire, which is actually precisely what you have just described. And that is another one of my links with Dr. Spring Chung and her indigenous Taoist wisdom. The system I learned from Mary is a Taoist system as well. And when Spring and I came together and merged, she's an acupuncturist, by the way. And so when we merged our understandings uh, it was, I think, a celebration of cultures, uh, okay. a celebration that reverberated around the world. Okay. So I, I have a couple of questions. Um, and one of them is in regards to um, a lot of what you write seems like it's connected to energy healing. And it seems very Chinese, uh, but you're using different terminology. So I wanted to ask you about that because that's part of the healing process. And I don't want to throw too much at you here, but I also wanted to ask you if our job is to remember, I also want to know, how did we forget? Oh, that's gorgeous <laughs> and stunning and challenging. Yeah. Uh, so I love it. So yes, I fuse many lineages, many sources for the presentation of the hands-on component of the Tara approach that I offer, which is a way that we can remember through contact with ourselves, through touch. It's how I remembered by learning this touch system on specific areas of the body from Mary that's what caused this nervous system reorganization that I didn't understand and kind of transformed me from a tortured Jewish girl from the Bronx into the bright spirit that I feel I have reclaimed my original brilliance. So that fusion awakened this understanding of who I really am, which was completely somatic. It, it, I, I, it felt like I changed, I reimagined myself, but actually I became myself. Mm. And through that, of course, I had to inquire into how, how did I lose this? Mm -hmm. How did I forget this? And when I look at the world, I see an incredible state of amnesia everywhere. And I think that story is the story of trauma and shock, uh, which I talk about in detail in my book, We Are All in Shock. I also talk about it in the new book, The Secret of Resilience. In that book, I think I speak to it somewhat more lyrically and personally, 
and in we are all in shock i'm more in teaching mode you mm -hmm. know this is what this is this is how you do this and so it's a workshop mm -hmm. we are all in shock is like a workshop the two books actually go very well together. I recommend people get both. <laughs> They're also available in audiobook. So you can just be doing what you need to do and practicing and learning by listening to these books. So trauma and shock played a very significant role in my personal life. Mm -hmm. But what is behind that personal story is a cultural and societal story that tells us how we forgot. Mm. We have been encouraged to forget. We are manipulated to forget. And I am not a conspiracy theorist at all. I am not speaking of this as uh, a conspiracy of people who want to wipe out humanity. That's not how I see it. I see it as a confusion on the part of people who profited from distorting original brilliance. And given the capitalist ethic, given a culture that emphasized power over, they proceeded in that direction, believing that's what they were supposed to do. So that's the confusion. So this manipulation, industrialization, you might say, of things like birth or healthcare, those basic fundamental rites of passage that have been stolen from us so that we're kind of always in this rat race, uh, running away from original brilliance rather than towards it. That's how we forgot. Hmm. Hmm. Wonderful. Yeah, it reminds me, I, I quote Henry David Thoreau a lot, but what he noted in Walden, you know, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And, you know, that's gendered language, but I think it fits for everybody Yeah, you know, because of that system. And it also occurs to me that even within some of the world's religious traditions, <laughs> that there is this idea of that we have, we're in amnesia, we have forgotten, you know, so I don't see it as conspiratorial at all. I see it as having a very strong pedigree to it, you know. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting way of describing it. And I think it's quite accurate. Yeah. So with this forgetting and this trauma that you're describing, I know that some have suggested that the, you know, trauma begins, you know, you described the 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 development of the embryo. And that can be traumatic and birth can be traumatic. And then we are expelled into this trauma filled world, but also you discuss epigenetics and that we inherit the trauma of our families as well. And this is something that I've thought quite a bit about. So I was wondering if you could, especially since you're the expert on this, if you could actually uh, maybe talk about these sorts of family traumas that we inherit. Yeah. I'm going to back that up just a little bit yeah. because of something I just wrote okay. uh, the other day, and it hasn't even been published yet on my sub stack. I have a sub stack called Crone Speak. Okay. Uh, so if people want to read my poetry and things like that, my essays, uh, that's where they'll find them. And I just wrote this essay that speaks to the what I call the microbiology of the nervous system. And basically what I'm doing is I'm demonstrating how the human nervous system functions very much like a plant in terms of its structural absorption and delivery mm. of what it experiences. So a plant has these incredible respiratory circulatory systems that are undifferentiated, like the embryo, that soak up what's there. So if there are pollutants there, if there are contaminants there, along with the beautiful water and soil and sun, the plant will circulate that uh, and disseminate that through its structure with the consequences of so doing. An embryo is very much like that. So in utero, 
our main intention is to learn. Hmm. I, I, you'll have to forgive me because when I start talking about the embryo, I kind of start to move like an embryo. <laughs> you know, it, might, it might look a little weird <laughs> to the people watching this, but I can't stop it. So uh, please forgive me and, and maybe use it. Maybe it'll yeah. help you. <laughs> sure, sure. So the, so the embryo enters this incredible mystery of structure and tissue and caverns and geology. And it's like coming into a magical land for the very first time. And there are sounds and there are sights and there are shadows and there are shapes. And the embryo, I try to describe this in my book, The Secret of Resilience. It begins with the soundscape, the way that sound comes into this contained area that is really multidimensional, you know, and the embryo enters into that to learn, where am I? What is this? And who are they? What are those sounds? Of course, non-verbal, but sensory. So for those sentences I just uttered, just see sensation communicating those senses and so the embryo is absorbing all of that and the embryo has to fulfill the mission of its will which is to address those encounters and navigate through them so for me I'll use myself as an example I've now worked with thousands of people and so I know that my experience is unique to me and at the same time shared with many others. So in my experience, I uh, was born into a family of refugees and lived in a situation where many generations were present as many cultures have. My, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins were all in the same environment. And there was a lot of hysteria. There was a lot of poverty uh, and the hysteria that resulted from that, the desperation and the connection with what was going on in Europe. And then in addition to that, my mother who was urged to marry, uh, she was one of six sisters. I talk about this in, in mm. just about all my books. So my mother married hurriedly, really passionately, but not carefully. And she married someone who was incredibly abusive. And she was shocked by that experience. And before she knew what had happened, I was conceived. And when my father returned from war, he was even more violent than before because he had a traumatic brain injury, hmm. which became the topic of my doctoral research. So I'll stop there. That's enough, maybe. Yes. There's a lot more that continued mm -hmm. after that in that same vein, but suffice it to say that I experienced all that. Mm -hmm. I, I took that in and this is what I've learned that is my original brilliance. I navigated that, Nick. Mm -hmm. I, I found my way through those assaults. I was profoundly unwanted it would have been preferred that I not be there. Uh, and many times I would have preferred not to be mm. there, but I surmounted that. And that theme I would say has repeated throughout my life. The confrontation with violence, the question, mm. do I really want to stick around here? Yeah. You know, this is not looking good. That's a question of this very moment. So, those assaults were about my mother and father, but they were also the product of what my grandparents had experienced as refugees. My aunts all were having their own form of that overload and trauma and dislocation and difficulty. And all of that was pouring into me so that I had an understanding of the world shaped hmm. uh, by, by what I absorbed. And what I understand now 
having posited original brilliance and living in original brilliance and evoking original brilliance in thousands and thousands of other people is that when you claim your original brilliance, you transcend those epigenetics. Hmm. I would even say you transcend some of the genetics associated with epigenetics because epigenetics turn on or off hmm. genes. And so you transcend that. And I would posit what is known in many cultures as a truth that you heal seven generations back and hmm. seven generations forward. Right. Right. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. And so if I understand correctly, uh, you know, because I can see that being born into this situation is going to inform you, but you're also saying that as you are forming it's, and it makes sense then, you know, that as you are forming as a fetus in your mother's body, that it becomes part of your body and that the solution then has to be somatic. It has to in large part be addressed in the body because it's going to be in there in the tissues, right? It's going to be in there. Exactly. Really it's utterly somatic. And my story is dramatic, mm -hmm. but everybody's story is dramatic. Sure. I mean, I can kind of feel the people listening and saying, oh, it wasn't like that for me. I mean, right. my mother and father loved each other and I was wanted. So I don't, mean to create different a hierarchy of trauma because the nature of prenatal life is designed to be challenging right. that's how we are shaped you know it's compressive it's daunting and out of that comes our original brilliance and no one is to say my situation was worse and someone else's situation was not as bad because you still have to face things like maybe a narrow pelvis you right. know Maybe, and I've encountered so many stories, you know, maybe there's a loss in the family mm -hmm. that no one anticipated. Grandma has right. a heart attack and mom is devastated by that. Mom and dad love the baby, but there's a loss that supersedes the joy of this new arrival. The, the way that evolves shapes who that person is and no one's at blame for anything. Mm -hmm. And that's, of course, a major triumph, you know, particularly given the drama of my situation that I would free myself as I have of blaming my father for his violence, blaming my mother for not protecting me from my father's violence. All of those blaming possibilities mm -hmm. have now been utterly and completely dissolved. Yeah. And if I understand correctly from your book, they've been dissolved into compassion. Yeah. Compassion and action. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of the action queen. It's like, yeah, compassion. Yes. Love. Yes. Connectedness. And then we have a contribution to make. Mm. And we're living in a time when our contribution is desperately needed. Yeah. Yeah, it's a all hands on deck moment, I think. Yeah. You yeah. Know? But to your point, you know, I think that I mean, you know, it's the first noble truth of Buddhism. You know, there is suffering. You know, mm -hmm. we all suffer mm -hmm. one way or the other. And even if someone thinks that they have had, you know, they had the perfect parents, perfect grandparents and everything. I was just doing research. I uh, I'm teaching a class and my this morning I tried to depress my students as much as I possibly could <laughs> because we were looking at the environmental issue. And so I'm doing this at a Jesuit university and it's a religion and ecology class. And so we're starting by reading Pope Francis's Our Common Home. Mm -hmm. And in the second chapter, he just starts like listing all of the issues. So I went deeper and one of the statistics I found was now they haven't done a lot of study on this yet, but some researchers were testing the umbilical blood hmm. and they found something like 200 chemicals hmm. in the umbilical blood. Hmm. So everyone now, it seems, and I think they have to do more research, but it seems that, you know, the fetus is not only in this the environment of the womb where it's already, you know, kind of dangerous and tricky, but now it's in this stew of chemicals mm. from outside. Mm. So 
everybody, everybody has to address this one way or the other, right? Yeah, yeah. And and it takes courage yeah. to do what you just did to press your students, as you put yeah. it. It's showing them reality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that takes courage because yeah. everybody seems to want to be cheered up all the time. Everybody yeah. seems to want to hear uh, oh, I'm so excited. Oh, wait till yeah. you see this. Or yeah. we have the most incredible program. I mean, that's what everybody seems to want. And there must be an, a, an astounding desperation in yeah. that kind of desire. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, it reminds me, one of the things that a line that you wrote in the book, which I absolutely love, is that you wrote, we are blinded by our unshed tears. You know, and I think that that's true. And I think that contributes to the amnesia, that some of the amnesia is purposeful. We choose to live that way in some aspects. That's what tortures me all the time, Nick. That's what breaks my heart. Even hearing my own words quoted yeah. back to me, it breaks my own heart again. Yeah. It's because I am reaching out with so much authenticity, with such an awareness. As I said, I am married to an environmental attorney who is a brilliant researcher, one of the authors of the Clean Air Act, which mm. has been destroyed and is being violated even by the current EPA. Uh, and he is a data man. And so I get the data. Mm. And I also was very close friends with a woman named Theo Coburn, now also an ancestor who wrote a book called Our Stolen Future, mm -hmm. which speaks precisely to that umbilical cord blood that you were referring to, the way that we're poisoning our babies. Mm -hmm. And the carelessness with which we do that. And that's why I say I rely on my original brilliance to make it through those awarenesses because I see this depressing truth. I see the carelessness with which people are living their lives day to day and I carry on and I will not stop. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> mm -hmm. We, we, we need, we need healers right now. I mm -hmm. think in so many ways. Now I want to go back based on what you were just saying and what we're talking about, uh, go back to the elements a little bit because one of the elements you discuss is the air element. And when you were writing about that, you wrote that, that this is likely where so many people are trapped in their evolution, that there's grief and airborne toxins. And you noted that unexpressed grief is gluing hum humanity to a step on the evolutionary ladder. And what I was thinking about was not just the toxins, the airborne toxins and whatnot, but literally something that has been part of the common dialogue for a few years now is this idea, I can't breathe. You know, mm -hmm. we've seen people being, you know, killed, you know, and they're like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. So it's like, there's a breathing aspect here. Wow. Right? Wow. That's so powerful what you're saying and you and you're speaking to someone. I can feel it just as you address it. I actually have been feeling it in this call because I'm someone with a history of respiratory issues. Mm. And look, I married the author of the Clean Air Act. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and of course you're quoting George Floyd. Yeah. May his tortured soul rest in peace. And I look at our culture. I, I'm going to tell you something I read just this morning. Because this is about how we are blinded by our unshed tears. You know, I am an advocate for regenerative health care, which is putting the tools of health care into the hands of people at the grassroots level. And this morning I read about a hospital in the Bronx, New York, which is where I was born. Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx, New York, where a woman was found dead in the stairwell and she had been there for five days. Wow. This was a non-English speaking woman who entered a door that said emergency exit. 
probably couldn't read it. She was ill. She had been waiting in an overloaded waiting room in a public hospital. She probably thought she was going to the bathroom or mm. out to get a breath of air. She had a heart attack or a seizure of some kind and she died and no one found her for five days. Mm. She had been living in a group home for refugees and no one noticed that she didn't return there for five days. That's the state of our healthcare system. That's the state of our response to refugees today in New York, mm -hmm. in the US, the place everybody wants to come to, the place people sacrifice their lives to come to. And I read that and I, I can't turn away from it. I feel that it is in us. It is in everyone to remember. It is in everyone not to be tortured by guilt because you can't do everything, but to find what you can do, mm -hmm. to go beyond that feeling of overload, which is a way of forgetting and come into making your contribution in whatever form your spirit guides you to do that. And that's what I live for, is to inspire that awakening in others through the reclamation of original brilliance. And I am doing my best to find ways to be efficient. Mm. And how I do that, because I've got to do it much more. Right. <laughs> and and I'm I'm just me, you know. I have right. a very small organization. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So the air element is what you asked me about. Yeah. And the air element is associated from the teachings I received from my beloved Mary Eno Burmeister with those unshed tears. Mm -hmm. And that's why I told that story because I can't, if I contain that grief that I felt for that woman who died and wasn't found for five days, whose absence was not even noticed, then it implodes in me mm -hmm. and my asthma gets worse, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. which I have pretty much triumphed over. The air element is what we're doing here, Nick, which is communicating and connecting. The air element is what transports our connection and carries it out over the airways like this broadcast will do. Uh, and the air element is connecting us with the tragedies on Maui right now, my neighboring island, this place I just moved to two days later, the fires on Maui. It's what connects us with the devastation in Canada because mm -hmm. those pollutants, those respiratory contaminants are flooding everywhere. And we're breathing in, just as we did in utero, we're breathing in the suffering of others. Right. What yeah. do we do with that? I just did my best to do something with <laughs> it by sharing that right. story. I was doing what you were doing in your class I've probably depressed a lot of people when I told that story, but I was depressed when I read that story and I've got to use that story then mm. to not stay depressed. Right. Well, the other thing that came to mind, actually, as you were speaking, and I don't know why I didn't think about this while reading, but there is a very long tradition in multiple religions of connecting spirit and breath. Mm. And so when you were noting, I forget who it was, but you were noting someone that was like all the phlegm or everything, you know, in the lungs that that's gunking us up. That's what's making things stick. I was thinking, and what that's doing is it's also speaking to the spirit. So when we can't breathe mm. to me, that seems like it's saying that there's a spiritual illness going on. Yes. And that the key here is that 
original, I want to say blessing, but I know that's not the right term, but original brilliance, original blessing, that's Matthew Fox. That That is a reconnecting to that spirit. That's what allows us I to- I love remember. that. I love that. And of course, you know, since you said that phrase, I've been thinking of George Floyd. Yeah. You know, yeah. and I mean, that's that's like the story of the woman who died in the stairwell. Uh, it's it's if that had been a white woman, would they have found her? Would they no. have noticed that she was missing? Uh, it the 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 racism is an affliction of the spirit mm -hmm. that has contaminated all of us, and that we have to follow what I think is the spiritual directive of the air element, which is communication. That's yeah. what I'm trying to get to. That right. that grief, if that grief just lodges, that's the phlegm and that's the gook yeah. in the lungs. So if, yeah. if it comes out, if it finds a form, and to me, that's activism. That's yeah. the original brilliance is you right. find a way to express your grief. If all of us who are grieving for that woman in the stairwell and for George Floyd could express our mm -hmm. connection with those people who could say, I am that woman in the stairwell. I am George Floyd and act on that. We would outnumber the people mm -hmm. that are murdering them. We would mm -hmm. outnumber the people who are destroying original brilliance. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. And I, I, I couldn't agree more. And it's vital right now, I think, for us to reclaim that original brilliance. But along those lines, for people who are watching or listening and they're like, okay, I, I kind of like some of this. And maybe they feel a spark. Maybe they feel a spark inside that's kind of hidden or it's they kind of want to fan the flames if they can. How would they go about doing that? What's, what's, how do you begin this healing process? Well, one of the things that I'm known for is how personal and personalized I am in my work. So if you fill the description that Nick just provided, reach out to me. Mm -hmm. I want to hear from you. So I'm going to give you my email address, not just my website. I'm going to give you my email address because that's really how I function, Nick. Mm -hmm. The people who study with me, I have a lot to teach. I teach mm -hmm. how to remember. I have developed a structure for how to remember. It's called the rediscovery journey. Mm -hmm. I can impart it to whoever wants to learn it. I teach about embryology. I teach about neurodevelopment. This energy medicine system that was transmitted to me, I teach that and that reimagines your nervous system as it did mine, but it also works for things like asthma, headaches, dizziness, those things that are the health consequences of life and particularly of climate crisis. So I teach all of that. I teach it as the Tara approach. I teach it as regenerative health for a climate changing world. And I offer it also through climate change and consciousness, which I develop. So my email is Tara, T-A-R-A -A hyphen approach at prodigy, P-R-O-D-I-G-Y dot net. That's a direct email to me. And then I have the website, Tara hyphen approach dot org. And then the climate change and consciousness website, which is a global collaborative community of climate activists, innovative visionaries, is cccearth.org. Okay, thank you. I, I will put all of those in the show notes and the video description, as long as well as a link for your most recent book. Now, the, these that's actually the last questions that I always ask <laughs> is, you know, where can people get uh, more information? Mm -hmm. But let's step back just for a minute before we have to go, because I know we're starting to run out of time here. But I was wondering if you could actually say a few more words about the climate change and consciousness program that you began. Yeah, it's a good story. When Donald Trump received the nomination, was elected actually, as president of the United States, I was watching that event, of course, with my husband. 
And we were both in a state of profound despair and shock. And it was a moment of shared horror. And in that same moment, something happened that I can only describe as a somatic event. Something descended into me and it was a command. And the command was really direct and specific. Create climate change and consciousness. Start it here. Bring these people together. Bill McKibben, Vandana Shiva, Naomi Klein, Shute Kat Martinez. And the list went on. Bring them together and create an event that wakes people up and call it climate change and consciousness. And don't stop there. Make that a living organism that evolves and changes and bring into that living organism all the indigenous leaders from Africa, from Aotearoa, New Zealand, from Latin America, from the Amazon, who you can identify and bring these people physically together in Northern Scotland at a place called Findhorn. Yes. <laughs> and I had no choice but to follow up those instructions. I was completely flabbergasted because I had no capacity to do any of those things. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the connections. I didn't know those people. My husband knew a few of them a little bit, <laughs> but not enough to get them to come to Northern Scotland without being paid, hmm. right? Because I had no money. I didn't have a backer, but it all happened. And that occurred in 2019 on the grounds of the Findhorn Foundation, which now uh, is closing its doors. But at that time, that was oh. actually the last conference oh. held at the Findhorn Foundation. Sorry to hear that. I, I know about Findhorn. I did not know that they were closing. Yeah, next month oh. they are closing down operations. Oh. Uh, and out of that event came this living organism, which is climate change and consciousness, and also walking the land Africa, walking the land Oceania, and walking the land Amazonia, which are the organizations of the indigenous leaders that came to Fintorn and spoke for their land and spoke for their people. And we created activism that supported their regenerative agriculture and their regeneration of their cultures. And this is alive to this day. Mm -hmm. And climate change and consciousness is a global collaborative. As I said, its main function at the moment is collaborating, bringing organizations together, networking together, and engaging in specific actions, particularly right now in regard to regenerative agriculture in Africa, uh, youth uh, in Aotearoa and Australia, uh, and policies and um, projects such as honoring water, the biotic pump, promoting the concept of the biotic pump as an innovative solution, et cetera. Okay, wonderful. Oh, good work. <laughs> good work on that. <laughs> yeah. um, so there's a question I, I don't ask every guest, but when the topic does get to our many environmental crises. I always like to ask, do you have hope? So that gets back to original brilliance. And it's the original brilliance in me that has hope for humanity. And even as you say this, and as I talked about the woman in the stairwell, bless her precious soul, I'm with her at this moment. George Floyd, bless his precious soul. I still feel the hope inside me, even as you say this. I, I believe we can turn this around. I believe yeah. in original brilliance. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, when I think that a lot of people don't uh, make the connections, and this is the way I always look at it, is that 
everything that we see externally is a reflection of an internal condition. And so the sickness of the world is a reflection of a sickness within us, but we don't have to be sick. We can heal. And so I always applaud all the healers. <laughs> well, in the course of this conversation, I don't know if people have noticed, but you're speaking to the air element. It's just so close to me, Nick. And I was having little asthmatic, you know, tremors because we were really touching into the core mm -hmm. of the suffering in this world right now. And I feel that in my chest and I feel yeah. it somatically. But every time I come out of it, and that's the teaching that I want to offer, that is the secret of resilience, that is original brilliance. I'm doing the treatment on myself as we're speaking here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have to do right. because I have to stay buoyant and I want right. to stay buoyant. Right, 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 right. Well, let me ask you one final question. Yeah. Uh, what are you working on next? What do you have coming up? Oh, you ask the best questions. <laughs> so I am really blessed to have a new book contract. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel so much when I talk about this. I have been invited by Arangatira Maori uh, matriarch to record her healing wisdom mm -hmm. in a book in her honor. She is in poor health. Uh, I met her as an outgrowth of climate change and consciousness because I was bringing indigenous leaders from Aotearoa and that's how I found her and that's how I connected with her. And we established a relationship which has grown over the years. And so I have been invited. It's such a, an honor. It's an amazing honor to write her healing wisdom and my wonderful publisher in her traditions supports it. So I have a contract uh, and that is coming uh, in a few months after I get yeah. settled here in Hawaii, I will uh, be traveling to Aotearoa, New Zealand to do this next project. In between now and then I am launching uh, the MA PhD program in regenerative health for a climate changing world. Dr. Spring Chung, who you mentioned is on that faculty as yes. is Stella Osorojos Eisenstein. Mm -hmm. And those uh, courses will launch in September. Uh, and then of course it's, it's through Ubiquity University. So it's on a trimester schedule. So just tap in to it through my websites through Ubiquity University, and this will be an ongoing agenda of courses. And I am always available. People who want to study with me are welcome to reach me personally, and I will dialogue with you about it, how to make that possible. Okay, well, wonderful. Well, Stephanie, it's been a wonderful experience speaking with you. And I just want to say that I honor that original brilliance in you and that spark that I see and all the healing work that you're doing. So I thank you for the time that you've given me today. Thank you. And I see your original brilliance also, Nick. And I love <laughs> it. I love yeah, it. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, hopefully we'll be able to speak again sometime. I'd soon. love that also. Okay. okay wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 102 of Verbal Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. For anyone who would like to support my work here on Rebel Spirit Radio, and please support my work, uh, please join my Patreon. Some of the perks for patrons include early access to episodes, shout outs to members, a members only Facebook page, access to the Rebel Spirit Radio Discourse server, and a monthly book club where we explore books discussed on the podcast, spiritual and philosophical classics, and books related to the cocktail apocalypse. I mean, remember, I am a professor of philosophy and religious studies, so consider the book club an ongoing classroom where you can go as deep as you want with me and other rebel spirits. Patreon also recently began offering free memberships, so... Uh, I'll be posting quite a bit of material on the Patreon site that is available to everyone. So please take a moment to sign up. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. 
And of course, if you'd prefer to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I still have big plans for the podcast and the YouTube channel. Right now, this is all a labor of love, so your support will not only help me in continuing what I do here, but will also help me grow the channel and the podcast. I'm going to continue with the Cocktail Apocalypse uh, live stream and plan to create at least one more this coming year. I'm also going to be creating more video content for the YouTube channel and uh, am working on putting together a few classes. This is going to take a lot of time and work, so I will be tremendously grateful for any support that you can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, co-workers, and of course on social media. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. Help me grow my audience. As I always like to say, I'm here on the front range now doing missionary work in regards to religions, spirituality and ecology, psychedelics and consciousness, and how all of this can help us heal humanity's relationship with the sacred earth. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help share the good news. Also, if you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. It only takes a second, and your five-star ratings really do help, especially if you listen on Apple. If you have a minute to spare, please consider posting a short but positive review. And please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to or watching Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be at peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.